A perfect midsummer evening at an airfield in the East Midlands of England. In fact, an historic one, RAF wittering near Stamford. From bases like this, since 1918, the Royal Air Force has maintained its skywatch over Britain and her interests overseas. But now, in the 25th year of the NATO alliance, how does the service fulfill that role? In this program, we shall see something of its equipment and its capabilities, from the pupil pilot on his first flight to the terrifying destructive power of live weapon attacks on Salisbury Plain. And we shall also see something of those other ships and aircraft on which the Air Force keeps a watchful eye in its round-the-clock readiness. But of course, for any of this to happen, men and machines must become airborne. And on the runway here at Wittering tonight, they're lined up and ready to go. And the first to take off, two Jaguars, the newest aircraft in service with the RAF. The Anglo-French replacement for the Rolls-Royce-powered American Phantoms, first delivered May 73. The first Jaguar squadron has just been formed on March the 29th, to be precise, number 54 at Lossimouth. Two Buccaneers from number 12 squadron, Aria Honington. This uh, subsonic, all-weather, low-level, long-range maritime strike two-seater a key aircraft in the RAF's new responsibilities towards the Royal Navy. Mark III from 5 and 11 squadrons at Binbrook, the RAF standard all-weather, twice the speed of sound single-seater interceptor. In service since the early 60s, still playing a key role in Britain's air defence. The Lightning takes off, climbs supersonically and accelerates to twice the speed of sound in three and a half minutes. Four Vulcans Mark II, the RAF's long-range heavy bomber and the world's first large delta-wing aircraft, now adapted to the all-weather ultra-low level attack, literally following the ground contours under the enemy radars. Four Vulcans airborne within the minute. Beside me, Group Captain Ray Davenport from Headquarters Strike Command, himself a former Vulcan pilot. This aeroplane is a joy to fly. It has lots of power and the ability to carry a very large weapon load a very long way. It can, of course, carry nuclear weapons and it operates equally well at both high and low levels. It's a proven performer that still has a very important part to play in our defense arrangements. Now, two Harriers from number one squadron here at Wittering, the world's first fixed-wing vertical and stall aircraft, built by Hawker Siddeley, powered by a single Rolls-Royce Bristol Pegasus vectored thrust turbofan. And tonight, we are to see the Harrier for the first time on television in its photographic reconnaissance role. These two are airborne for the RAF College at Cranwell to photograph a formation of aircraft on the ground, which we shall see at the conclusion of the program. And also, at this moment, airborne and approaching Birmingham are two Phantoms of Number 2 Squadron flying in from Laarbruch in West Germany on a photographic reconnaissance mission. And this is their target, target time 8.20 at our Birmingham television studios at Pebble Mill after a 500-mile trip on which they will have photographed their local church clock at Vitsa and Cologne Cathedral before their final run in here. Now, this is live this evening, June the 21st, remember? So if you live anywhere near Pebble Mill, you can rush out into the garden and see the aeroplanes. 20.20 the target time, 18 seconds to go. And all these pictures we hope to show you before the end of the program. Ten seconds to go. The Phantoms coming up to the conclusion of a 500-mile trip across Europe. And here they are, two seconds to go, as they line up on the target and shoot their film. 
bang over the top and bang on time to the very split second led by Wing Commander Bunny Warren of the OCF number two squadron, whom we'll be talking to later when he lands here with those photographs. Well, we've already seen a lot of flying and to the Royal Air Force or indeed any civil airliner, any aircraft on the ground is a liability. Consequently, the role of the ground maintenance crews and the speed with which they can complete what is known as an operational turnaround is as vital to the efficiency of a fighting squadron as that of the air crews. These two phantoms from number six night ground attack squadron have just landed from an operational sortie and we are to see them change crews, rearm and refuel. The clock has started. The target time is nine minutes. Already we see the fuel lines being got into readiness. They will take on 1,000 gallons of fuel, say 10,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds in each of those under wing tanks. There you see the two 1,000 pound standard retard bombs to be loaded onto one of the aircraft. And already a hive of activity. There's a Leapus flare being lifted into position. Each of those de uh, generates five million candle power. You remember I told you that this squadron were night sortie specialists. The team of uh, 10 technicians and uh, a chief technician working away at their allotted tasks. As we looked on for a moment from our airborne camera in the RAF Puma helicopter flown by Flight Lieutenant Dick Langworthy. And there you see the two chief technicians controlling each of the crews, checking off the points. The uh, Vulcan gun under the belly will be loaded with 800 pounds of ammunition. But now we go further afield, we'll be back here to see the conclusion of this exercise. And remember that nine minutes was the target time for a nine and a half ton load to go on to each of the aeroplanes. But now, as I said, we go further afield. To maintain today's efficient defensive skywatch over Britain, the Royal Air Force uses and is part of the complex radar and communications network of NATO. The UK Air Defence Region is a vast area stretching from southwest of Land's End to Iceland and Norway. Approaching aircraft located by the constantly scanning radar show up as luminous traces on the controller's display screen. Hello, hello, 002, North, November Lima, Mike, Hotel 55, Zombie, not allocated, strength 2, height 360, speed 300. The Norwegian controller tracks the approaching aircraft continuously. He decides that they are unidentifiable and must be investigated. He passes his information to a radar station in Scotland and also to Strike Command headquarters. And he updates his computer. Zombie splitting. Southwest, November Lima, Lima Hotel, 1-2. Zombie, Chilo, Chilo, 001. Uh, Luchers, Luchers from Buck and Telegraph. Uh, possibility of trade. Now crossing 30 degrees east, initial report, strength 3, heading 270, speed, height unknown. John, we have some live traffic. Right, the channels will be 1 and 5. The radar plot is taken up by the UK radar station and at strike command. On the large topographical display, the traces show clearly off the northwest coast of Norway. Marm controller? Scramble mission 5-1, Dragonfly, call Bucken on pre-brief. Dragonfly is the Victor tanker to support the intercepting fighters. On the topographical display, the two traces rapidly approach the north of Scotland and show no sign of changing course. Bucking controller, scramble. And at RAF Lucas, by the Firth of Forth, two Phantoms are scrambled to intercept. In very few minutes, they are airborne. Thank 
WREF girl plotters in the operations room move the arrows indicating the position of both zombies and the intercepting phantoms. Now the phantom rendezvous on course with the Victor tanker and tops up his fuel to replace what has been used on takeoff and the climb to height, thereby extending his range by many hundreds of miles. Distance between the interceptor and his target is now closing fast, around a thousand miles an hour or more. Radar surveillance continues. The fighters are turned onto a course parallel with their quarry. Five one, your mission is to intercept, identify and shadow. There he is, a bear of the Russian long-range air force, a not infrequent visitor, and by no means unknown to us at Strike Command. Mission 5-1, you are to return to base. Your pigeons point Charlie, 230-190. There you have seen the argument in favor of an air defense system which includes manned aircraft. A missile cannot conduct an investigation of an intruder without destroying it. But the manned interceptor must also be capable of destroying if necessary. And this Phantom is on a training sortie which will end in destruction. Its quarry, an old meteor jet being flown by remote control. The Phantom pilot is guided to his target by radar. His weapons on this occasion, two Sparrow air-to-air -air missiles. A direct hit. The Meteor's tail is blown clean off. The Phantom and the Sparrow are a proven deadly combination in the confident hands of a trained crew. And there we see the four Sparrow missiles back here at Wittering have been loaded onto their firing racks in readiness for the next Phantom sortie as this live operational turnaround approaches completion. Remember, nine minutes was the target time. And there, an incredible shot of an incredible weapon. The Vulcan gun, a super six-barrel Gatling, electronically controlled, firing 6,000 rounds a minute. And uh, that, as I told you, has already been loaded with 800 pounds of ammunition. Two canisters of cluster bombs. Each canister contains scores of bomblets, and each one of those is fiercely destructive. Twenty seconds to go, and the job is completed. We'll be looking out for the marshals, SAC Collins and SAC Richards, to wave the first phantom out. And here we've got, oh, more than ten seconds to go to the completion of a complete operational turnaround, fully armed, fully uh, fueled. Out they go. To us watching perhaps an impressive performance. To you, Group Captain Davenport, standard practice, I presume? Indeed, uh, you well know, Raymond, the threat to this country is measured in minutes and seconds. And therefore our response must be similarly timed. This is standard operating procedure, and no surprise either to me or indeed to the turnaround crews themselves. And now back from their photographic reconnaissance of our Pebble Mill Studios in Birmingham, the Phantoms of Number 2 Squadron flown in from Larbrook, Germany. Wing Commander Bunny Warren, the CO, leading in the pair, and you see the Harrier coming in just behind. You remember I explained that he had a, a photo mission 
down to uh, the RAF College at Cranwell to see a formation on the ground, which we shall see in the sky here in this very same frame of sky at the conclusion of the program. But now, the operational photographs which have been taken by these aeroplanes are being brought to base for very high-speed processing and subsequent analysis. And you have been able to time for yourselves how long it has all taken. This Phantom has come 500 miles and more, photographed three targets, the last one a precision attack right on the very second, and now landing at the end of the runway with under the center of the belly, the camera and the film. And here's the Harrier already landed, squadron leader Jack Pugh making a stall approach, landing on the grass, and now taxiing straight up to deliver his photographs. You see the, uh, the uh, uh, specially constructed undercarriage of the Harrier with those wide outriggers making light of the indifferent ground well off the runway. This is one of the many uh, capabilities of the Harrier which make it such an extraordinary aeroplane. Can almost go up steps by the look of it. And now, squadron leader Jack Pugh's task almost completed as he taxis right up to the actual, the Air Transportable Reconnaissance Exploitation Laboratory. There it is, those two boxes. Effectively, a highly mobile darkroom with trimmings. There, the film will be uh, processed, printed, and enlarged. And, as I said, we will see the finished result now being unloaded from the uh, uh, camera in the nose. Now, rarely in the history of aviation are the Phantom here, which I was going to say rarely in the history of aviation has an aeroplane been more versatile than the Phantom we are looking at. And there you see the uh, camera bubble where the Vulcan gun was under the night sortie Phantom, which we were looking at just now. And also rarely in the history of aviation has it been true to say of a single aeroplane, this has added a new dimension. Of the Harrier, this is demonstrably true. No aircraft before has been so able to disappear into the landscape and then spring out of it and into action. Versatility is, of course, the keynote of the modern Air Force. And out comes Captain Tom Plank of the United States Air Force, here with one squadron on an exchange posting. The Harrier has, of course, made an enormous impact in the United States. It's the first British military aeroplane bought by the Americans since the First World War. So out goes the first Harrier from cover for an operational takeoff, but there are other ways to hide a Harrier. An inflatable hangar, easily camouflaged, of course, 50 feet by 30 feet by 15 feet high, self-supporting, it has its own compressor, electrically powered uh, from the mains by batteries or a generator. And in case it may look flimsy, I can assure you it's been tested and has withstood a force a gale, let alone the jet wash of a Harrier. It is, of course, a highly portable structure. Speed of erection being one of its many qualities affords very good protection, not only for the aircraft, but for crew working on it. And, of course, it could uh, be erected anywhere in the world. And out comes the second Harrier from that hide. But the art of war is improvisation. As was quoted to me last night by the station commander here, Group Captain Ian Cappy. And uh, in the operational field, a double wall of hay bales might fall to hand and could be usefully pressed into service to provide a good hide and a lot of protection for a concealed aircraft. But if you go down in the woods today, 
you're sure of a big surprise. And already that wood has contained and subsequently revealed a number of startling surprises, but none more than that. The classic Harrier capability to take off vertically from a clearing no wider than its own narrow wingspan. But the Harrier's hides need not necessarily be in the countryside. We hear a lot nowadays about the urban gorilla. Well, how about an aircraft as an urban gorilla? This sequence was recently filmed on Operation Big T, in which the Harriers of Number One Squadron really set the aviation world by the ears. The aim of uh, this exercise was to evaluate high-intensity operations in support of an army brigade under armored attack. Twelve Harriers from Number One Squadron flew 364 sorties in three days. Serviceability was excellent. In fact, one Harrier flew 45 consecutive sorties with no unserviceability and all in very unusual environments. Well, the environments uh, could scarcely be more unusual than those we have just seen, but Flight Lieutenant Steve Jennings and Flight Lieutenant Chris Marshall, both instructors of 223 OCU, now bring their Harriers in to demonstrate the unique air handling capabilities of this aircraft. Slowing down from about 230 knots, a gradual transition right down to the hover. You see the astonishing maneuverability at zero forward speed and how the nose is brought up to finally bring the aeroplane to a halt standing on the plume of its own jet. Now here's an interesting quote. The aeroplane won't amount to a dam until they get a machine that will act like a hummingbird, go straight up, go forward, go backwards, come straight down and alight like a hummingbird. It isn't easy, but somebody is going to do it. And the prophet who wrote that was no less than Thomas Edison, 1847 to 1931. The two aeroplanes at the hover. And remember, as I told you, 110 of these aeroplanes have been bought by the Americans for the U.S. Marine Corps. Three squadrons are already equipped, and one of them will soon go overseas. The vertical descent and land. But now, as a result of recent political decisions, the world's first V-Stoll fighting aeroplane, invented and built in Britain, and first in service in Britain with the Royal Air Force, is to be further developed, not here, but in the United States. Nevertheless, information over their home base, the Harriers of Number One Squadron, who have made and continue to make aviation history. But no matter how advanced its equipment, the efficiency of any Air Force is ultimately dependent on the capability of its pilots. And in this respect, no Air Force has been better served than the RAF by its training command. For many years, one small but important source of embryo pilots has been the University Air Squadrons. This bulldog is from the University of London Air Squadron based at Abingdon. At the controls, one of the instructors, Flight Lieutenant Punkett, his pupil, Stephen Wilkin, an undergraduate reading mechanical engineering at study. A big moment for him, his uh, very first RAF instructional flight, and we can eavesdrop on conversation in the cockpit. Right, Wilkin, here we are, everyone on your first flight. Yes, sir. Very impressive, isn't it? What we'll, what we'll do is we'll climb straight up in the runway direction. And that really was his very first flight. Yes, sir, very impressive, he said. But now, higher up the scale in every sense, a jet provost, the workhorse of training command, which takes on where the bulldog leaves off. After about 80 hours on bulldogs and another 80 on these, the pupil is a pretty proficient pilot with aerobatic experience, some formation flying, and, of course, 
total familiarity with the spin. There you see it from the pilot's point of view. And more important than learning how to spin, how to get out of a spin. They're a classic recovery. And now the pride of training command and specifically Central Flying School of Little Wizard. The Red Arrows, once again under the leadership of squadron leader Ian Dick, AFC, awarded the MBE last Saturday, you'll be pleased to know. Now tonight's sortie is strictly a training flight in the intensive work program leading up to their first public reappearance at the end of July. They've got two new pilots who've only been with them a couple of months and of course they were grounded in the interests of fuel conservation which uh, incidentally the Air Force took extremely seriously. But like the great team they are, as you can see, they have not allowed their standards to slip an inch despite the difficulties. As a serving officer, Ray Davenport, this must be a stirring sight for you. Yeah, indeed it is. Uh, clearly they have not forgotten how to fly during their enforced layoff. They are now in the final stages of their training program, as you said, and it looks to me to be working out very well indeed. And the important thing to remember as we watch them on this occasion specifically is that what we are looking at is the ultimate, perhaps, in applied airmanship, and that this is the product of hours of hard work, teamwork, uh, mutual trust and self-discipline, which is what the Royal Air Force is all about. And nevertheless, great fun at that. We have... Uh, squad leader Ian Dick's RT so we can hear his monosyllabic instructions to the team. There's the diamond change, so smooth that one didn't see the moving of it. And there is Super Concord, the Red Arrows' Rolling personal in. tribute no. to the Concord team, their neighbors at Fairford. This standard of precision flying makes the crowds gasp at air shows wherever the arrows display. But it is symbolic of that other key oh, function of the service in our defense. And so, as the Red Arrows write their inimitable signature across the sky, we go back, as it were, to the end of the beginning to see Flight Lieutenant Plunkett bringing in the Bulldog at the conclusion of young Stephen Wilkins' baptism of flying the Air Force way. Well. 